reading is from Judges 6 and 8, so it's in three small sections. <clears throat> Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with swarms of locusts and it was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abbey Ezraites to follow him. He sent messengers through Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also unto Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so they came too went up to meet him. And then in chapter 8, if I can find him, here we are, 32 and 35. Chapter 8, 32 and 31. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah, of the Abbey Ezraites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves in the, in the, the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show gratitude to the family of Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, for all the good things he had done for them. Good morning, it's so good to be here again with you guys and uh, it's a privilege to preach the word of God. I can move this, can I? Now before I do that, I've asked the people if it's right to do so. I'm going to give you an update on what happened with Matt recently and Tiffany. Uh, as you know, he battled uh, brain cancer. And I didn't know him that well because I've only been at the church for 18 months. But he was an incredible man and him and his wife upset me in the, in the right way. Uh, a few weeks before he died, we were in church and he happened to be in front of me, you know, a few rows in front. And we're singing a song and there he is like this, you know, knowing that death was very, very close at that time. I, 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 I had to stop singing, it just, just got me, you know. And then... Uh, last Sunday, Tiff came in with the girls, you know, and again sat just in front of us. And uh, Tiff was just hugging the girls, and, and I'm just sort of absolutely lost the plot, really. And this couple faced an amazing battle and won. So they had a, a private service in a church, and I'll say two weeks ago on a Friday, I think it was. But um, last Thursday afternoon, uh, unbeknown to me, the information that uh, we went to a celebration service at Oakley Hall, right? And we all know that Oakley Hall is quite posh, isn't it? Yeah. I only go there to ask for money. Anyway, um, they, they hired what was the wedding tent. It, it seated lots of people. There were over 300 people there. The place was absolutely packed. And the service and the cost it was all prepared by Matt. Every word that was said, every video clip and song, and it was a real gospel service. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and then one of his friends read uh, an encouragement from Matt about knowing Christ, yeah? 
And um, after that, I, I, I gave us a meal and we just sat around and just talked. And I just want to say that what an amazing couple. What an amazing God. We don't know why he wasn't healed. In fact, we don't know why he got the brain tumor in the first place. But he was saying in his sort of, his own eulogy, if you like, it's not the length of years that counts, it's what you do. And I, afterwards, I, I spoke to Tiff before, I said, Tiff, Tiff, so how many people here are church people and how many are his friends from his business, etc.? And she reckons about half and half, right? So 150 people who knew Matt heard the gospel from him. And it was amazing. So I thought I'd say that just to let you know, you know, like the, the end of that chapter. And uh, Tiffany is, is in, my, in my home group because I'm a rebel. I'm not doing what the main church is doing. I'm doing something, something else, you see. And Dave, Dave Bishop knows that. He knows I'm a rebel anyway. Anyway, and even now, uh, I saw her and said, can it be at my house on the 20th? Yeah, of course it can. So she's back into it serving, isn't it? So it's wonderful that, you know, having a, a battle like that and then just to continue to be in God's work is amazing, really. And uh, I just praise God that I, I knew him a little. And he's it, just a wonderful man. All right, yeah. We just pray for Tiff and the, and the girls down there that you will help them through this next phase of, of their life story. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Right. I've been asked to do Gideon, right, which I thought I would not tell the story in detail because we know the story, don't we? Yeah? I mean, have you heard a message on Gideon before? Yeah, I guess. And we just thought, thought that. so I'm going to talk about the battles that we have to win in our lives, but go through some of the main points of Gideon and pull out from that things that will help us. Now, I don't know about you, but I hope this works. Right. right. We all have battles, yeah? Now, a battle is a situation where you might feel out of control and you need help. You need resources and you have to change your lifestyle. Now, the reason for battles, why they happen, could be because you are in sin and the Lord wants you to battle through that to get back to purity again. You know, some, as a pastor, I met many people, oh, what time is it? Um, that they're in a battle because of their own stupidity. You know, and you have to very, very lovingly, which I am, of course, and kind, <laughs> not you naughty girl or naughty boy, if, if you stop doing that, that battle might cease, yeah? You know, and so y you might be in a, in, in a battle because of the uh, culture is having a go at you. And you have to realise that that is a big battle today. And in that battle, you have to be an Ephesians person and stand on the gospel. You know, stand with the armour of God and say, we're not going to move, the gospel of Christ is this and that's it, yeah? And don't let culture write your theology, yeah? And in fact, that's probably a corporate battle or a church battle. We might have battles that prompt us. And I think this is probably one which, um, I think it's not a prompt, I don't know, near enough anyway. I'm from Birmingham, so I can't speak very well. Anyway, um, and, the, and the, the Lord is saying to you, look, you know, come on, go and fight this battle for me, like you called Gideon. Yeah, come on, mate, go for it. And, and, and like Gideon, you might not be a battle person. Gideon was a wheat farmer, that's what his name meant. And this farmer guy, who was just a farmer, came to be a warrior in a battle. So he can take you as just a plain ordinary person from, oh, my you the sun will shine on the righteous. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. You, you might be a person that lives in this little village and, and, you know, life's okay, comes to church and you think you're too old to do God's work and you, you're quite relaxed. And it might prompt you, go out and do something. Why don't you do this? So in a sense, that, that battle is prompted by God and I'll tell you through the, through the, the message that 
God will resource you in that battle. You might that choice right. You might choose to go into battle. You might say, I'm fed up of the stuff that's been taught in schools now about this rubbishy stuff. I'm going to go and have a go at that one. So battles can be of all different natures and reasons, but it's probably... Uh, can, you, can you all see that? Um, but there's probably other reasons as well. But the battle that um, Gideon was in, it was interesting because the people were uh, in a dire state and then he called Gideon. Notice he called Gideon. He didn't call an army officer. He didn't call a great priest or a Levite. He called a, a normal person, a wheat farmer. And there's probably wheat farmers around here somewhere. So we had the call. So the reason for the battle that the people cried out to God. Sometimes we need to cry out for God and say, Lord, what can I do in this battle? You know, I, I know for a fact that kids, children nowadays are lost. They've got identity problems. Why not be a, a surrogate dad or a granddad and put your arms around them and give them comfort? Yeah, the battles are out there if you want to choose them. So we, we live in a life where battles should be part, really, of our lifestyle, to battle through stuff to the glory of Christ. And of course, the biggest battle that you and I have been through is the battle where Satan lost and Jesus won when we became Christian and became born again, when we found Christ in our life. That's the biggest battle. And I don't know you very well, but all I know is this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord, and you serve him in the best way you can, when you die, just like Matt, you'll be in his presence. Hallelujah. That's the biggest battle in your face. And, and I'm, I'm not being flippant here, but when... I'm off my notes, is that all right? I'm sort of... Oh, when, when you go through trials like Matt went through, and many other people, you're looking at and praying for healing, and you have frustration and a deep unsettlement in your heart that why didn't God heal him? What God knows best. You have to rely that God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And that was his time to go. And we all have a time to go. And in the meantime, we live the gospel out as best we can to give God the glory. Yeah? So the battle of life will end one day for all of us, but it's a victorious battle because we will be with Christ forever. And the Gideon story is a story in the book of, of Judges, and we all know why the people had Judges, and then just after that they moaned and they got kings and all that stuff. They're still messing up with kings. So the, the people of Israel were quite naughty. Uh, and this battle was won not with conventional warfare, not with the, them going into, into, into a war with their shields and swords, etc., etc. It was won by God's spiritual intervention. See, uh, in Ephesians, sometimes, like I said earlier, we have to stand, it's Ephesians 6.10, strong, stand in the strength of the Lord and his mighty power. You know, and we have to know that, that we, we are under fire from the enemy anyway. Some of the things that happens to us are for righteousness sake. For no other reason why people pick on you is because you're a Christian and they're not. They don't know Christ, you do. They are, uh, their, their whole mindset is different to yours and they cannot understand why you think this way, why you go to church. But you have to stand there and take abuse. I remember one of my companies uh, I worked for, um, I went there as a chief engineer, and not be known to me, that the guy that was my top man uh, wanted the job, and he spent every week, you know, trying to mess up my career. And uh, at one point, he got a bit dangerous anyway. But only I believe because I was a Christian, yeah. And you have to stand in the power of his mind and be a witness against all adversity, and some of it that you don't understand why it's there, but some of it 
because we are in a battle between light and darkness. Yes? Right. Let me, uh, the background was, you, you know, the Midianites were a desert people, descended from Abraham, second wife, Keturah. That's a bit history for you. And the Midianites were, were a nation who actually wanted to occupy the, the uh, Israel land and stuff. And the, and the Midianites were sort of almost the first e SAS, if you like. Their power was very oppressive. And I know some research on this. It, they would get their camels and, and march in, go and pinch all the food and the grain, etc., and then go out again. And they never actually occupied Israel, but they they go in there, spend a few days all week, just gathering all the fortune and the gold and come out and leave the Israelites poor and impoverished, hence the reason why they went to hidden caves and tried to hide them. And in fact, in the context, you'll find that Gideon was, was threshing wheat by a wine press. You know how they did that in the old days? They would they'd throw it in the air and let the wind blow and the, thing, and the chaff would go and, and the wheat would fall. So I reckon because Gideon was hiding in a wine press, I think he must have been going, you know, as if there's probably not, not enough wind there. So this guy was hiding, fresh in the wheat from the Midianites, so much so that um, God used him. I don't know what, what God saw in Gideon, but he knew he was the right man. So the, so the people cried to the Lord, and Gideon comes out, out, a man of limited vision. Now, if you're like me, um, when God calls you to do something, maybe through one of these issues here, you don't feel confident. Oh, it's not me, I can't do this. No, I can't go and say this, this to that person. No, I can't. It's not my style, it's not me. So Gideon, a man full of fear rather than faith, went through the process of, of the fleece, remember that? Dry and then wet, yeah? And, and God answered his prayer. So, so Gideon got actual encouragement uh, from the Lord. And we know that, so I think it's in, it's in um, the last few verses of, of chapter 6, which we read part of. And in fact, the readings actually were... We chose them because, just to recap on that, if I can find the right sheet of paper. It, the first one was the, the reason for the, for the battle that people were sinful, and, and Gideon was chosen to do that. Then the, uh, the second one was when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and blew the trumpet and started the battle. So this man had to go through all the fleeces and tests and very, very nervously went to battle. And of course, the last one, interestingly, is at the end of Gideon's life. We know the story. He rallied 32,000 men and he said to them, if you're fearful, go home. Yeah? You can't fight a battle in fear. You have to fight a battle in the power of the Lord, with your inner spirit, with your determination to win the battle. So, so God knew that his men wouldn't do any good because they were fearful. So God reduced the size of the army from down, leaving 10,000 behind. And what happened then, to make it even, even more interesting, we saw it on the, on the kiddies video, and those that bent down in the water and, and drank like a sheep would, right, were sent home. And the guys that lapped the water like this were retained. I have a little theory on this, right, that the guys that were having their heads right in the water weren't aware of what was going on, right? But the guys who lapped like a good soldier could keep an eye on what's going on. So when the Lord is with you, you have to bow down faithfully and keep an eye on what Satan's doing. And then you'll be chosen for a battle that really, maybe you don't really want, but if God is with you, and he will be, he will sort you out. The story of Gideon is um, quite interesting because it was a battle that the Lord won to save his people. 
a battle that you and I can win to save other people. Now, many of you here are fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, yeah? And one of the battles that I have in my family is about for my grandchildren. Because they are in a society which is not, um, I would call it anti-Christian. It's not passive anymore. There's so much input through television and school and their mates and the old phone thing. There's so much horrible stuff to make them conform and, and their identity. And even though, you know, top scientists and doctors say it's all wrong with damaging children, it's going on and on and on. And I think as parents, grandparents, fathers, mothers, uncles, aunties, we have to come alongside little Mary and say, how are we getting on, you know? And it's very important that battle is won because what Satan is doing, you see, in order to win a battle, you have to pick the weakest point, you see. And also, like God, Satan is a planner, so he knows that if he grabs these children in a generation's time, the whole of society will change, yes? And that's the battle that I know Christ will win. You then look at other battles in the earth, and you then read the Bible, Matthew 24, Ezekiel, you know, Thessalonians, and you look at all these wars, especially, you know, Israeli one again, and the earthquakes and all that sort of stuff. And I know that it's reported more, so we are more aware, but you add to that, that part of it, the physical part of it, you add to it the other part where the love of most will grow cold. You can see that things are happening in, in the universe, the cosmos, and in people's hearts and culture. So these battles are being won. And we might think, to some extent, they're being lost, but then I then think, looking at the Bible, because this stuff is prophesied, yes, you're almost not praying against prophecy, but you are aware that God knows. So just like the situation of a personal loss, you know that our Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega. He built it all. He's going to come back soon. And with all those battles, in the end, the final battle, Christ is victorious. Amen? And sometimes, maybe, we, we may not enter a battle because you want to do something for God. But God says, no, because I've got that covered. There's no need for you to go to Zimbabwe or somewhere and preach to God, I've got that covered. You have to understand that battles should be a part of our life. Now, you might be a prayer battler, a person that, that prays and prays and prays. And very often, when uh, people came to Christ, I would say, um, have you got an old granny or an aunt that prayed for you? Oh, yeah. But my aunt, who lives in Coventry, she's, yeah, and, you, and you, you understand that some people often have a person that's been praying for them for some time before they come to Christ. So keep praying for people. Battle through those horrible uh, enemy-type stuff that's going on around their lives. Because I think one of the problems that Christians have today is because we are too comfortable. And we don't have many of these. And... That the Bible expresses that woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Well, like being a Christian, it's like being on a, on a cruise, you know. You get fed twice a week through the Bible. You meet people that are nice and everything's fine. But actually, we should be on a battleship, not a cruiser. So if you haven't got a battle, ask God to give you one. Because, you know, again, all this stuff... When it happens, eventually, what comes out of it is that you, you, you gain spiritual strength. And I'm going to probably spell it wrong, I can't think at the same time as wrong. So, you either win the battle, hallelujah, or you know, just like Gideon, that even though you have no hope in winning it, you give faith to God, and the outcome is incredible. Let, let's look at the outcome. What happened was the 300 men were spread out over the hills, right? And the, and the, the midnight were in the valley. 
And physically and naturally, Guinea must be, he must be thinking, oh, even though I heard the, the news from the soldier, this is crazy. You know, I haven't got, I haven't got sword or spear or shield. All they have was old vases and, um, and lights and stuff, you see. And then we can read in, in, in chapter 7 but, um, where, where the battle took place. So the army, they're estimating that the Midnights had probably 100,000 men or thereabouts. So there, there you have minimum with 300 men. Now, 300 men is not a lot, really. You work out the ratio, it's pretty horrific. And maybe for you and me sometimes, the ratio that we live in is just unbearable. How, how, Lord, how can you get me through this situation, this battle, this problem? But, you know, one person with Christ is very, very powerful. You know, we are mighty. Are we mighty? Do you feel mighty? I, I, I saw a guy in the gym recently, I, I, and uh, he had a fantastic physique, you know, and he had a, a real sort of small vest on. So I said, I, I noticed that you guys who've got muscles wear the shortest possible vest to show off your muscles. I said, guys like me wear a baggy T-shirt, you know. <laughs> anyway, but see, <laughs> we get strength from the Lord, don't we? And it's not physical strength, it's spiritual strength. So think about a battle. Lord, how can I win souls for you? Now, I, I'm, I'm 56 plus VAT. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, some people might say, well, Bobby should slow down. No, no. I, I want to be like Paul. I want to finish the race, mate. I want to get my crown through my faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. I want my Stephanus. So the, it's not a golden crown you get. You know it, don't you? Have I told you this before? It, Paul was alluding to the, the races, that if you ran a race, you would get a wreath, a winner's wreath. The diadema in Greek is what Christ wears, our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we get a crown. Hallelujah. And, and you have to run to win. You might not be first, but you'll still get past the winning type and you'll win for Christ. And I find that energy in me keeps me going sometimes. Don't give up, Bob. And God will show you stuff. And you, and you realise that God can use you. Um, and you'll have people come to you and say, do you remember, you know, ten years ago you said this? No, I haven't got a clue. That changed my life, Bob, you know. And of course, you can't remember, it's all glory to God, isn't it? I can't say, oh, I knew that, I can't remember the darn thing, you know. We can do it, we can help people. Just be battle aware and battle ready. So there you got, there you got Gideon with 300 men, and then a, a change over a shift, he decided to smash the jars, light the light, and shout, yeah? And in the darkness, the men were busting around, they stabbed each other, and many, many were killed. And, you see, people who live in darkness are lost and will die without Christ, yes? Yeah? But if you've got Christ in your life, you, you, you live in the light. And we can win battles beyond our dreams. Beyond our dreams. So it was the, the time of the battle was crucial. I would write it down, but one of my uh, favourite lifestyles that I, I try and look at is this, that to know the season you're in. Now maybe, like, like Gideon, he had to wait until God organised everything by reducing his army, by telling him what to do. But the moment came which was right. And maybe sometimes, you know, the battles that you are facing, the victory's not for today, but God knows the victory is in a year's time or five years' time, yeah? But you have to choose your moment and realise that when God chooses his moment, you can get victory. We, we live in, in an age of probably 95% of the population are not Christians. 
you know, a reckon on the last survey, about six to eight percent people go to church, and of that six to eight percent, probably half are born again. This is a survey done, I think. So we are living in an anti-Christian society. And, and they battle their issues with drugs and drink and other sort of uh, events. One of the things that modern theologians are saying is this, what's happening. You know the rise of people having sort of um, help, you know, physical help, mental health and all that sort of stuff, which is all good, but then this sort of, people talk about their halo and about their, you know, they, they are spiritual, but wacky, you know. And what's happening is, is that society subtly and carefully are robbing people of who they are in Christ. You know, um, I like that guy who's a nature guy, who's adopted daughter to do things together. Um, he lives in the New Forest. Who? Right. So I said, he's got a new thing on the TV about the, about the Earth. So I watched it. You know, the bunk from tanning off the Earth was 40 million years old. So I turned it off. So there you have a lovely man who likes nature, but is totally away from God. It's like Romans 1. The first thing that happens in society, people worship creation, not the creator. And eventually they fall into all sorts of sin. And... Uh, here we have Gideon facing this army, and God won the day. And then what happened then? Because he, it was routed, he then called on, and people think he called on the 10,000 that were left, and they chased them and won the battle. It's interesting that sometimes when you're in a battle, you feel very alone. I don't know. I can't think of an idea. I mean, say you want to change something here, you do. God's shown you to do this. And people say, oh, no, 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 not, no, no, don't do that. You know? But then that person gets two or three people uh, alongside him, and before you know, the battle starts to develop, and people think, oh, I could win here. Then you realise, actually, that you're now drawing more people to help you win the battle. Let's say, in the olden days, not so much now, you couldn't turn a car when it was stationary. Right? But as soon as you moved it a little bit, you could turn the wheel. Is that right? So if your battle is tough, but you see some movement, keep going, because then, eventually, it would be easy to, to move that thing on. So think about these things. Say, right, battles are there. Let's go in, in the power of God. And of course, because Gideon didn't fight per se, with knives and swords and shields. He fought with what God told him to do. It's spiritual. And the Bible says that the, the battles that we, we wage are not a man thing. It's all God's stuff. Supernatural. It's all in the spiritual realm. So prayer, reading the Bible, being honest, being pure, what sort of stuff, puts you in a place where God can use you to fight a battle. And the battle can be done. This is so important why, and I'm not, I don't know if it happens here, but I love, I don't call them testimony because testimony is like a, a, a posh word. I, I'll say to somebody, come, up, come in and tell your story of what God's done for you. And then when, when you share your testimony or your story, that encourage other people, doesn't it? So maybe, I don't know, it could be an idea here that, you know, once, twice a month, you take it in turn to come up and say, even though this, this and this, I'm trusting God and we've seen a victory, yes? You know, if, if you told me, you, see, I don't know you at all. I don't know your name. I don't know where you're from. I know you're very, a beautiful lady, but I... <laughs> I'm a smoothie, aren't I? Anyway, but I, I, I reckon if you sat down with me, had a cup of coffee, your story is, is victorious. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Like, this friend, you know, what you've been through, you could tell that to your daughters and your friends at a coffee morning. Because some people think that us lot here are quite... Jesus saved. That's right. He does. See, 
Some people might think, we're all posh here because we're, we're well off and most of you look quite smart. The pastor's a bit casual, we either, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they think Christians use Christ as a, you know, a help. But we live for Christ, so share it. Share your battles and victories. Amen? So um, maybe that might encourage you. I want to finish on a rather sad note. Because this is, this is typical of today's world, right? I asked the reading in Judges 8, the, the whole Gideon story is in Judges 6, 7 and 8, right? And I do apologise if I haven't been through the whole story when Gideon pulled down his father's Asheroth poles and all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah, because before Gideon was given the job for a battle, society was absolutely awful, full of sexual stuff which is beyond our description. But look at this. Gideon, son of Joash, died a good old age, right? And was buried in the tomb of Father Joash. In fact, he was quite a busy man because he had 70 sons. Not bad, is it, really? So he had lots of energy from somewhere. So he had quite a large family. So he died, you see. And then, uh, then Gideon died. Then the Israelites again prostituted themselves to Baal. They set up Baal Perez as their god, you don't remember, nor their god who had been rescued them from all the hands of the enemies on every side. They also failed to show mercy to, and respect to Gideon. I've done some research on this, and we, we all know this, and I, I don't want to offend you, but, but it was all sexual stuff. There was sexual prostitutes at um, attached to the temple. The whole thing went absolutely wild, you know. Um, homosexuality, anything else was rife in this nation. And time and time again, Israel cried out for help, God won the victory, and after that they went back to their real open sin. And I would like to suggest to you that our society is very sexually immoral. Very. Even to the point now, I didn't watch it while I was looking for the rugby thing, you know. And there's a new program on now, I don't know what it's called, where three couples will then be, be uh, together and then they'll be interviewed, and then they all go and have an orgy. And this is on Channel 4. You know, Big Brother. Um, many, many. Uh, programs devalue marriage and devalue identity. We are made in God's image in Genesis, right? And they are undermining this. And this is what the Israelites did. The Midianites are gone, they had all their food they could eat, life was pretty cool. Okay, let's go back to the, all, the, all the sexual stuff. That's what they did. So, and, no, and obviously later on that, uh, God got involved again and kings, and even that was a nightmare, because many of the kings were in the two kingdoms, you know, northern kingdom Israel, southern kingdom Judah, most of the kings in the northern bits were evil, you know, Rahab for one, uh, Ahab for one. So, you must realise that even though we win battles, there's still battles left behind us to fight. What we have to do is encourage our younger people so they, they can face those battles and win them, yeah? Robert is a young man. I'm more than twice his age. Um, my eldest granddaughter is only two years younger than him. But this man, as a pastor, mm -mm, it's going to be tough. And you have to stand on the word of God. You have to obey what God tells you to do to fight your battle, just like Gideon did. If Gideon went into that battle with 300 men, he would be absolutely white, wouldn't he? But because he chose God's ways and he obeyed God's timing, he won the battle to God's glory. That's what you've got to do. So, I know it's not easy. I wouldn't like to be a young pastor. Maybe I do, actually. I like a battle. But it's going to be tough. Hold together the gospel. Teach others 
about Christ and win battles for God's glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.